This is Dr. Gary Yates in his lecture series on the Book of the Twelve. This is lecture number 20, Micah, the Message, chapters 1 through 3. In our uh, second lesson here on the, the book of Micah, we are going to work our way more carefully through the books uh, chapter by chapter. But let me just remind us of uh, what the structure and message and, and ultimate contribution of Micah's ministry was. Uh, Micah preaches in Judah in the 8th century during the Assyrian crisis. Uh, he has a book that, that uh, warns of judgment in very severe terms, that Jerusalem is going to be plowed like a field and uh, the, the Assyrian army is going to come to Judah. But there's also the promise of salvation, the promise of ultimate restoration, and even the structure of the book of Micah itself reflects that. We have three major sections in the book that are all introduced by the word to hear. And uh, there's a message to hear in chapters 1 and 2 that involves military invasion and exile, but then God bringing a remnant back uh, uh, of his people and, and turning them into a, a, a nation and a people once again. There is a message to hear in the middle section of the book where uh, the promise of salvation becomes more prominent. And after God has inflicted this judgment on Judah and Jerusalem, there's going to be a renewal and a restoration of Israel, and Zion is going to become uh, the center of God's kingdom as it's restored, and uh, there's going to be peace, and there's going to be a Davidic Messiah that will rule over Israel. And then in chapters 6 and 7, uh, there is a call to hear, there is a final reminder of Judah's failure to be the covenant people that God has wanted them to be. Uh, there's a wailing and a mourning as this judgment falls upon Judah. In chapter 7, verses 1 to 7, we see the personal pain of Micah himself as a godly man living in the midst of this crisis. But there's also the hope in chapter 7, to, uh, verses 8 to 20 at the end of the book, that the mourning and the wailing and the grief over what has happened in the Assyrian exile is going to turn into a, a, a time of joy and restoration. So as we look at this, uh, we see a powerful message of judgment and salvation. And remember that we learn from Jeremiah chapters 26, verses 7 to 19, 17 to 19, that Micah's message played a significant role in helping Hezekiah to turn to God and uh, in bringing about the sparing of Judah from the judgment that fell on the northern kingdom. So how does Micah communicate this message? Uh, what are the things that he says to the people of his day? And then we'll also think about and reflect upon what is, uh, what, what is the application of that message for us. In chapter 1, uh, we have uh, a message of judgment that the focus of this message is going to be on Judah and Jerusalem. But in the same way that we saw the prophet Micah, as he was called to minister to the northern kingdom and to preach a very unpopular message uh, of judgment, um, Amos uses great rhetorical skill uh, in making that message heard. Uh, he begins by talking about the judgment of the nations, then he turns to the judgment of Judah, and then uh, finally he drops the hammer uh, on the people that he's actually preaching to and talks about the judgment of the northern kingdom. Micah is going to do something in chapter 1 that I, re that I think reflects that same type of rhetorical skill. And we're, we're reminded as pastors and teachers, uh, yeah, we have a, a, an important message to preach make sure that we think about how we communicate that message as well. Our rhetorical skill is not where our power comes from, but it is something that God is able to use as we communicate the gospel. And so Micah is going to do something um, that, that is very similar to what Amos does. He begins by talking about God's judgment falling on the nations and on the world. Then he is going to focus on God's judgment falling on Samaria, and then, finally, he's going to conclude with the message that this judgment is going to fall on Judah and Jerusalem. And in the book of the Twelve, I think that's one of the significant things that we see in the book of Micah, is that the judgment that is talked about in Hosea and in uh, uh, the book of Amos and in these preceding books that have focused on the northern kingdom, now that judgment is falling on the southern kingdom of Judah as well. And so, uh, in, in the beginning of this, we see God coming down as a warrior. We have that motif and that image and that metaphor prominent in this chapter. And as God comes down upon the earth, uh, we refer to this as a theophany. This is uh, an appearance of God. 
and God is going to appear as a warrior, and the earth shakes and trembles and actually melts in his presence because of the greatness and the power and the awesomeness of God. Pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it is how the book begins. Um, for the Lord is coming out of his place, out of his holy temple. He will come down and he will tread upon the high places of the earth and the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire. And so uh, we have the white water of God's wrath and God's judgment here. And when the Lord shows up as warrior, even the earth is not able to stand in his presence. All right, God is not just coming down, however, to judge the earth. The reason that God is coming down as a warrior in this particular instance is that God is coming down, verse 5, because of the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. And so then uh, Micah will speak about the judgment of Samaria. Uh, and it says, uh, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? So again, in the same way with Amos, uh, when, when the people in the northern kingdom heard Amos talking about the judgment of the southern kingdom of Judah and uh, how God was a judge of the earth, they would have applauded that message. He would have gotten a pretty good love offering uh, as the people were responding to this. But remember that the final punchline of that message is that judgment is going to fall on Israel. Well, Micah does this in reverse. And then he's going to say, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? But here's the second half of that verse. What is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? And so now, uh, the, southern, the people in the southern kingdom would have said, yeah, we, we understand why God's judgment is going to fall on the northern kingdom. They, they do not have uh, the leadership of the house of David that God sanctioned and proved to be the leaders of the, the true people of Israel. They do not have the Jerusalem temple, which is the place where God had chosen his name to dwell. They have the, the apostate sanctuaries at Dan and Bethel and Gilgal and all of these other places. But Micah's message is, is that the infidelity of the northern kingdom has reached the southern kingdom. And as a result of this, the same thing that happened to Samaria is now going to happen to Judah. And so the Lord is going to, in verse 6, I will make Samaria a, a heap in the open country and a place for uh, planting vineyards, and I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. Samaria is going to be devastated and ruined. However, Micah also says later in the chapter, in verse 9, I will make lamentation like the jackals and mourning like the ostriches, for her wound is incurable, talking about the wound and the injury of God's people, and it has come to Judah, and it has reached to the gate of my people to Jerusalem. And so the rhetoric of Micah is to join together the judgment and the devastation of Samaria, now that has reached Judah and Jerusalem, and the southern kingdom is impacted by the Assyrian onslaught, uh, onslaught and invasion in the same way that the northern kingdom has. And just as that was not simply something that had happened as a political accident or, or due to the military circumstances and situations in the 8th cent century, this is directly judgment from God. Okay, So very effectively at the, at, at the opening of this, of this book, we move from the judgment of the world, God treading down as a warrior on the nations, but now specifically coming as a warrior against his own people. First, Samaria. The people of Judah would have agreed with that, but now that judgment is also going to fall on Judah. So very, very effective in the way that he presents this, but I still have to believe it was hard for the people of Judah to accept this, and so we're going to do some, We're going to see Micah as he makes this message even more vivid in the second half of chapter one. Uh, again, he's going to do something that is rhetorically brilliant. And what happens in this section is that Micah is going to give us, uh, through the eyes of prophetic imagination and prophetic revelation, he's going to give us uh, the picture and the image of the Assyrian army marching through the nation of Judah, capturing the cities of Jerusalem. And, and what he's going to do here is that he's going to specifically name certain communities and, and remind the people or impress upon the people who live in these different communities, these places are going to be caught up in the judgment of God. 
Remember that in the Assyrian inscriptions, it talks about the fact, and in the Assyrian annals, it talks about the fact that the Assyrians captured 46 cities in Judah. Well, Micah is going to make this very real and vivid by mentioning specific cities. And what you should see as we move from chapters, uh, chapter 1, verse 10, down to verse 16, you can progress along with the Assyrian army as they sweep through the land of Judah. Uh, Isaiah does something very similar to, uh, to this for us in Isaiah chapter 10, verses 28 to 34. He pictures for us uh, through, through both, again, prophetic imagination and revelation, what it will be like as uh, the armies of Assyria go through these various villages and communities in Judah. And what Micah does with this is that he makes a series of puns and word plays on the names of these various communities. And he either references their name or their historical significance and, um, and, and uses that as a way of communicating the message. What it does is that it makes the message more impressionable. Remember, before Micah writes these messages down or before they were recorded as the words of Micah, they were preached orally. He's preaching on the streets in Judah and Jerusalem, trying to convince the people of the judgment that is coming. And, and to impress this upon a people that have heard it all before. And again, they've heard recurring and repeated warnings from the prophets throughout their history of judgment. To make that real and vivid, Micah talks about the actual communities and cities um, uh, that are in Judah. And he makes puns and word plays on these cities that impresses the seriousness of the message on the people. If, if I was listening to uh, Micah as a, as a member of his audience in the 8th century and I was hearing this message, it would cause me to think about if I lived in one of those villages, wow, this judgment is coming upon us. This is striking close to home. If I had family or relatives or were part of a clan or, or family that belonged to these different communities, it would wake me up and impress upon me the seriousness of this message. And so all of this ultimately contributes to the shock value of Micah's message. The people of Jerusalem would have said in all of this, we're not as bad as the people of Samaria and Israel. We don't have the long history of apostasy that characterized their worship uh, places and their sanctuaries. We don't have golden calves uh, in the temple at Jerusalem. Uh, but they have had... Uh, the apostate uh, altars and things that, that Ahaz has brought into the, into the temple. We're not Baal worshipers the way that people were in the northern kingdom under Ahab. But Micah's point is God is going to judge the southern kingdom in the same way that he's going to judge Samaria. And so he begins with these series of allusions and word plays. And uh, to try to, to, to portray, if a prophet were going to do this today and were to talk about God's judgment on America or those kinds of things, he might say things like this, Washington will be washed away. Or Watertown is going to have its Waterloo. There's a historical allusion there, and you know what that's about. Uh, Los Angeles, the city of angels, has become the haunt of demons. Uh, I live in the city of Lynchburg, and in the history of the South, we've... We've had a history of lynchings and, and just injustices and horrible things that have happened there. So if a prophet were to say there's going to be a lynching in Lynchburg, that, that would raise all kind of connotations that would impress upon us both uh, the shock value and the seriousness of the message. St. Louis and St. Paul have become unholy cities. So those are the, those are the kinds of uh, word plays. And, and as you walk through this, it, it kind of makes us smile but, but that's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this was to impress the seriousness of the message. So the prophet begins by saying, Tell it not in Gath, and weep not at all. So tell it not in Gath. Here, instead of a wordplay, we have more of a historical illusion. This is the words that are used after the death of Saul. Tell it not in Gath, uh, this Philistine city. We don't want our enemies to know about this national disaster that has happened. By alluding back to that time when Israel lost their first king, uh, it's reminding us that a time of national disaster is coming. The parallel line says, Weep not at all in Beth Ophrah. 
Okay, so they are not to weep, they're not to mourn. Uh, Bethla Ophrah is related to the Hebrew word for afar, and so the house of dust here, uh, it says in Bethla Ophrah, in the house of dust, they are to roll themselves in the dust, and dust and ashes and sackcloth and all of those things are associated in mourning. So tell it not at all, weep, uh, tell it not in Gath, weep not at all there. We don't want them to know about this disaster, but in the cities of Judah, they will be weeping, they will be mourning because of the disaster that is going to come upon them. The house of dust is going to roll in the dust. Uh, pass on your way, inhabitants of Shafir, in nakedness and shame. And the word Shafir means something that is lovely and beautiful, but what we get instead is the, uh, is the contrast that the people who live there are going to become exiles. And there is going to be the ugliness of nakedness and shame as they are led away as prisoners. And so Pleasant Town is going to go through a very unpleasant experience. Um, the inhabitants of Za'anan do not come out. And so this place, Za'anan, uh, sounds like the Hebrew verb yatsa to go out. It shares two consonants there. And so the people of Za'anan will not be able to yatsa. They will not be able to go out. Uh, they will not be there to, uh, uh, they, they will not be able to escape the onslaught that's coming because they will be besieged and surrounded by the Assyrian army. And, and one of the things that happened in siege is that the inhabitants of that city, they were not able to leave. They were not able to escape and get away. And ultimately, they would be held there until they starved to death uh, or, or ran out of food and water. So uh, Za'anan will not be able to go out. There's irony in that. The lamentation of Beit Etzel, the house next door, um, uh, the Lord will take away from you its standing place. And Beth Etzel, this house next door, um, they will not be able to help their neighboring cities because they're going to be affected by this judgment as well. They will not be able to provide protection for their neighbors because it will be too busy mourning over its own uh, destruction. Uh, verse 12, the inhabitants of Maroth, uh, the word Mara. Uh, bitterness uh, in the book of Ruth. Uh, Naomi says, do not call me Naomi, pleasant. Call me Mara, because the Lord has acted very bitterly against me. And so the inhabitants of Maroth, bitter town, ironically, are waiting for something good, but it's not going to happen. Because instead what has happened is that ra'ah, disaster, calamity, has come down from the Lord. And so Bitter Town is going to experience disaster and calamity. They are not going to experience good and blessing. And again, it's talking about what happens as the Assyrian army sweeps through. And then the first stanza of this is going to, to, to close by saying, because disaster has come down from the Lord to the very gate of Jerusalem. And so we've worked through these series of towns, and we've, we've talked about the different places that are going to come under judgment. But the first stanza of the poem closes by focusing on the city of Jerusalem. The target, the ultimate goal of the Assyrian army will be to reach the city of Jerusalem. And remember that in 701, after they had captured the cities of Jerusalem, what are, or the cities of Judah, what are they going to do? They're going to surround and they're going to besiege uh, the, the city of Jerusalem as the capital and as the religious and political center until the time that God delivers the city. So in the second stanza, we return to these word plays. Harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. The word Lachish resembles the word for team or for horses, Rakesh. And remember, the goal of Lachish uh, was as a military garrison and a fortress to provide protection for the city of Jerusalem. So if they're harnessing the teams and the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish, it, it looks like uh, they're, they're going to provide that protection. But really, uh, Lachish is going to be uh, wiped out by the Assyrians. It's going to be conquered by them. And they can harness the chariots all they want but they are not going to be able to withstand the, the, uh, the, the onslaught of this enemy army. 
Uh, they, they, will, uh, they will have to harness the chariots instead of protecting Jerusalem. They will have to harness the team in order to get out of town as quickly as possible so that they can flee away from the enemy. The protection that Lachish was designed to protect, that's not going to be there. And that's what this wordplay is trying to convey. This verse also says that Lachish was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were found the transgressions of Israel. So what are we talking about here? I think uh, Lachish has become the beginning of sin. It's been a source of, of sin for the people of Judah and Jerusalem because it has been one of the reasons that they have trusted in their military strength rather than putting their trust in the Lord. They have thought that they were militarily secure enough to survive this onslaught. They're, they're not going to be able to do that. And uh, this, this false pride ha has caused them to, 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 to not repent and to not come back to the Lord the way that they needed to. All right, in verse 14, the word plays continue. Therefore, you shall give parting gifts to Morasheth Gath. Okay, now before we think about the word play, I want to remind you that Morasheth was the hometown of Micah. And so Micah, as a prophet has, uh, I, I think, sort of the unwelcome duty of actually proclaiming judgment on his own hometown. And the pain of this and the significance of this, again, Micah is not using these, these word plays and these, these puns as a way of mocking the people for the judgment that's coming. The pain of this is very real for him. This is going to touch his own life and his own family and his own friends as, as it comes upon them. And so the purpose of the word plays and the things that are going on here is to, is to cause these people to realize the seriousness of their sin and, 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 and in, in the hope that they will take this message seriously and repent and turn back to God. So the word play that is there with Morasheth Gath is that uh, the word Morasheth sounds like the word uh, Moorasha, the word for betrothed. And so we're talking about someone that is engaged. Well, Morasheth Gath, uh, this city that sounds like betrothed, uh, is actually going to be given as a parting gift or as a dowry to the Assyrian army. And, and in a sense, uh, they are going to be the gift uh, that uh, they're going to be the plunder that the Assyrian army takes away. So this word that seems to be connected with something positive uh, the word for betrothed and marriage and the happiness of being in a family and, and all of those things, it, it becomes an ominous message that they are going to be given away the way that uh, the father of a bride would give the dowry uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the family of the groom. Uh, this city is going to be given away to the Assyrians. Um, the, the next city that is mentioned, the houses of Akziv which sounds very similar to the word akzav, the word for deception or falsehood. The houses of akzib shall be a deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. Uh, the kings of Israel thought that the various towns and villages and fortresses and all the things that they had there, the numbers of their city would pro provide protection. The walls around a city would uh, protect the people that lived inside of them. But the houses of Akziv are going to be a deceitful thing. They will not hinder uh, in any way. They will not impede the progress of the Assyrian army because the Assyrians are going to systematically make their way to Jerusalem. Akziv will be one of the towns that falls in the midst of all of this. Uh, the Lord says in verse 15, I will bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Marashah. And the word Marashah seems to be related to the word Yarash, uh, to conquer, to possess. It's a word of strength. It talks about the fact that uh, Israel possesses this land. However, the, 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 the possessing city, the conquering city, is ultimately going to be conquered, and it's going to become the possession of the Assyrian army. There's irony in the way that the term is, uh, the name of this town is used here. The glory of Israel, as this closes, the glory of Israel shall come to Adulam. And just as we had at the beginning of this uh, long message about the uh, different cities, 
is that now instead of a wordplay, what we have here is a historical illusion. And in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1, Adulam is one of the places that David is going to flee to as, uh, as he flees away from um, as he flees away from Saul, and in the same way that David had to run and had to and and had to be on uh, uh, on his horse, getting away uh, from his enemy, the same thing is now going to happen to the king of Judah. And so, this is a very ominous message about what God is planning to do to the kingdom of Judah. And again, the focus of this sermon. Okay, what a, what, a, what a prophet or what a preacher focuses on at the beginning, middle, and end of the message, that, that's, that's what he's trying to, to focus on. The city of Shalom, Jerusalem, is going to be caught up in all of this. Uh, the wound is incurable, verse 9. It has come to Judah, it has reached to the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. Uh, verse 12. Uh, because disaster has come from the Lord to the house of Jerusalem at the end of the first uh, at the end of the first stanza, at the beginning of the second stanza, harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin for the daughter of Zion, and then at the end of this, in verse chapter one, verse sixteen. Make yourself bald and cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle, for they shall go from you into exile. Throughout the sermon, he's focused on the judgment of Jerusalem. And then at the end of this, there is a warning of, of, of exile for the entire nation. When, when Jerusalem falls, the rest of the nation will go with it. So the same thing that has happened to the northern kingdom of Israel is going to happen to the southern kingdom. And as we hear this message, and as we see the severity of it, uh, as we see the rhetorical skill with which um, Micah presents this message, you know, we, we have to say, wow, the people had to listen to this. It is so skillfully and uh, effectively and passionately uh, conveyed to them. This message had to make an impression upon them. But until the time that Hezekiah repents, it seems that largely uh, these warnings of judgment are ignored, and, and, and that's why the judgment falls in the first place. All right, in chapter 2, in the, uh, as we continue in the first section, what this section is going to do is it, as it complements chapter 1, we have the picture of the judgment, we have the invasion, we have the announcement of the judgment coming first. In chapter 2, we have more the explanation of why this judgment comes. And uh, the, the primary thing that Micah is going to focus on is that Micah is going to focus on the sins of the leaders in Judah. And uh, going back to the common theme in the 8th century prophets, the problem of justice and the failure of the civil leaders in Judah to practice the kind of justice that had been laid out and prescribed in the Mosaic Law. But also in this section, there is going to be a focus on the prophets who as the spiritual leaders of Israel have led the people astray. And ironically, one of the groups that are going to stand most opposed to Micah, who is preaching the word of the Lord, are going to be these other prophets who are not preaching God's message. And as Micah is preaching God's judgment and telling the people what they need to hear, these other prophets are preaching God's blessing and they are preaching what the people want to hear. And so one of the reasons that it's hard for the people, in spite of the pathos and the passion and the effectiveness and, and, and the truthfulness of Micah's message, as he's talking about the invasion in chapter 1, one of the things that keeps them from hearing this is the counter-message that is being given to them by the majority of the other prophets. So in chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, this issue of social justice and how the leaders of Judah have failed to practice that and have led the people astray, that's the emphasis here. And there is a threefold repetition of the word ra'ah, the evil that these people have done. That's God's estimation of this. They are not simply manipulating the law. They are, sim they are not simply using the law uh, to, to break. They are doing what is in the eyes of God uh, is absolute moral evil, and as a result of that, judgment is going to come. So the prophet says, Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. 
Uh, when the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house and a man in his inheritance. So we see the same thing going on in Judah that happened in the northern kingdom. There is oppression. Isaiah talks about this. Chapter 5, verses 8 to 10. Woe to those who add field to field and seize them and they lust after their neighbor's properties and they oppress them and they mistreat them and abuse them and do all kinds of dishonest things because of their greed uh, and their desire to have more and more. Micah is going to preach about those social sins as well. Verse 4 says this, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster. So in verse 1, they, they devise and they practice evil on their beds, ra'ah. The Lord is going to bring disaster, ra'ah, against them because of what they are doing. Um, uh, you will not be able to remove this uh, evil from your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily as you have in the past, for it will be a time of disaster, ra'ah. So the Lord is going to bring ra'ah against the ra'ah that the people have committed. And um, a major reason for the judgment is going to be the social injustice that's taking place. However, in chapter 2, verse 6, as we've already talked about, Micah also focuses on the sins of the false prophets who are proclaiming this message that is their message. It's not the word of the Lord. They are promising the people something that they cannot uh, provide because they are simply telling the people, hey, you're God's people, things are going to go well, and notice their reaction uh, when, when Micah preaches to them. Uh, they are going to say, do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of such things, disgrace will not overtake us. So Micah not only has the challenge of trying to convince these people of the truthfulness of the message, he has these prophets opposing him that are preaching a counter message, and they're saying, Micah, you shouldn't be preaching these things. We heard your message where you made all those word plays and puns on the cities of Judah. You shouldn't be talking about this because disgrace and disaster and calamity is not going to overtake us. What are you talking about? We are the people of God. Now the interesting thing as they make this comment, do not preach, the word that is used here is the Hebrew word nataf. It is not the normal word for prophesy, uh, the root word nava. It's the word nataf. And in other places, this has... Um, this has the idea or the meaning, kind of a root meaning, of uh, to drip uh, or um, uh, uh, something that is dripping. It, it means to drip in Judges chapter 5, verse 4. It has this meaning in Amos chapter 9. The mountains and the hills are going to drip with wine. In Proverbs chapter 5, it's the word that is used for uh, the seductive speech of the adulteress. And so her words drip like honey. So they don't, they don't simply say to Micah, don't prophesy, nava, do not preach uh, nataf, do not preach this dripping message. And they are either dismissing it as something that should not be, that should not be paid attention to, that Micah is somehow trying to deceive the people, or what they might be saying is, Micah, stop foaming at the mouth. Stop, stop preaching this kind of message. And what Micah does to turn this around is when he says, is when they say, do not preach, not tough, he turns around and says, thus they preach, not tough, and he categorizes their words in the same way. One should not preach this foaming at the mouth message that disaster is going to overtake us. However, you are preaching a worthless, you're the one who's really preaching the worthless message here, and ultimately disaster is going to overtake us. It's not hard for us to imagine, as we have these two groups of prophets, we have people like Micah and Isaiah who were warning the people of the judgment that was going to come, that they need to take this situation seriously, that the Assyrian crisis uh, is real and, and God is behind this versus the prophets who were saying, yeah, we're going through a tough time or we're going through a difficult time, 
but we're the chosen people of God, and this disaster will not ultimately swallow us up. Which message do you think the people were inclined to hear? Okay, obviously, the same, the same today. When people talk about God's love uh, and divorce that from his justice and his holiness, you know, that, that, that's something that's attractive to people. It's a message they want to hear, but it's not necessarily the message that they need to hear. Micah is going to go on and say, and, and uh, in, in, in kind of a sarcastic way in verse 11, as he's engaged in this conflict with the false prophets, he said, you know what, if a man were to prophesy in this place, if they were to go about and utter wind and lies, right, they're going to categorize my, my preaching as nataf, foaming at the mouth. I'm going to talk about them just uttering the, the, the wind and lies. Their, their words are worthless. He says, if there were a prophet that were to go about uttering lies and were to say, I am going to preach to you of wine and strong drink, that would be just the prophet for this people. If there was a prophet that would show up on the street and say, hey guys, there's going to be plenty of beer and wine in your future because God's going to bless us and we're going to be prosperous and everything's going to be okay, that would be exactly the message that these people would want to hear. And, and, and so we get the reality of prophetic conflict that, that often these true prophets of God had to face and experience. Micah and Isaiah faced this uh, in the 8th century, and it's a, it's a real part of Micah's ministry. As, as he's preaching on the streets, uh, there are probably other prophets that are preaching a different message just down the street, or maybe who are trying to interrupt him and intervene in the message that he's preaching. And say, wait a minute, Micah, we have an objection to raise. We're the people of God. Why would disaster ever, over, ever overtake us? The prophet Jeremiah in the 7th century is going to deal with the same thing. And Jeremiah is often going to talk about these prophets who announce, Shalom, Shalom. But Jeremiah says the problem is there is no shalom. Disaster is coming. Jeremiah chapter 23, the people want to hear this message, and it's the message that's popular then and that appeals to them because it promises the people that God is going to ultimately rescue and deliver them out of trouble. But the problem is it's not God's word. It's simply the imaginations of these prophets. The true prophets like Micah and Jeremiah who are warning the people of judgment are the ones who have stood in the counsel of God. They know God's plans. They know God's intentions. They are coming to announce those intentions to the people, but the people instead want to listen to the prophets that are simply giving the empty, vain, delusional dreams of their own mind. That's the difference here. Now, we understand if we were in the audience here, we understand the inclination to want to listen to these positive prophets. We understand why the people would want to do that. We also understand probably the struggle that these people often had. How do I know the difference between a true prophet or a false prophet? Maybe at times in, um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a home uh, around the city of Jerusalem during this time, there may have been discussions by families as they were talking about this message at night. Hey, we, we've heard this prophet say this, and we've heard this prophet say that. Which one do we believe? Uh, most of the false prophets uh, that, were, that were around in the days of Micah uh, and in the days of Jeremiah did not wear t-shirts that identified them. I am an official false prophet. Many times they did not advertise themselves as false prophets who spoke in the name of Baal. They would have presented themselves as prophets of Yahweh. And so how do we know? And, and so I understand the struggle and how difficult it must have been. How do we sort through who is a true prophet and a false prophet? But in light of the circumstances that were going on in the land at this time, it seems like it was rather obvious to realize that God was bringing his judgment on his people, the covenant curses were coming into effect, and the people needed to take that seriously. In light of the way that the nation had lived, in light of the prominence of the social sins that were there, in light of the idolatry and the religious sins that, that often were the, uh, the reason for that in the first place, it should have been obvious to the people if they had a true understanding 
of the nature of the covenant between God and Israel and a true understanding of what that relationship was supposed to be like, it should have been obvious to them that judgment was what they should expect. Part of what is underlying this struggle, however, is um, not just a, a, a conflict between two different messages. There is an entirely different ideology behind all of this. And ultimately, trying to think about the theological foundation of all of this, there is ultimately a fundamentally different understanding of the covenant being reflected in the message of prophets like Isaiah, uh, Micah, and Jeremiah, and these false prophets who are saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And, and, and what, what that fundamentally different understanding of, uh, of the covenant is all about is that prophets like Micah and Jeremiah are going to, uh, uh, to emphasize the idea the covenant that God has with Israel includes both blessing and responsibility. It includes both promises and commandments. And if we have not, and if we have not kept the commandments, then we have no right to expect the blessings. And if one actually would just, you know, kind of open their eyes and take an honest look of what was going on in the society of that day, the social and the religious sins that were there, it should have been obvious to the people, we have not been faithful covenant partners, therefore we do not have the right to presume uh, on God's blessing and God's protection and, and that God is our good luck charm who's always going to be there to protect us. Uh, I, I, I think there is a reminder to us today that our relationship with God, uh, th those two aspects of God's relationship uh, with the church today are still there. There is both blessing and responsibility. We cannot presume upon the grace of God. If our lifestyle does not reflect the confession that we have made and, and, and does not reflect... Um, uh, a, a, a godliness that shows what God is like to other people, we do not have the right to expect that God is going to bless us. We as, um, as, as a nation do not have the right to simply say, God bless America, if we are not the kind of people that, that God really can bless. And so God's blessing always carries with it covenant responsibility and, and, and covenant obligation. And, and so the people of Israel and Judah, they have wanted to focus on the blessing. God will always be there for us. God will always protect us. They have forgotten about their covenant responsibilities. And if the people of Israel and if the people of Judah, if they had had a correct understanding of covenant, it should have been fairly obvious to them, we need to take the message of Micah seriously. And ultimately, when the Assyrian army has surrounded the city of Jerusalem, the king, Hezekiah, does take that message seriously, and the repentance and the faith of the king is ultimately going to bring blessing to the entire nation. Now, as Micah was, was facing uh, these false prophets, and as Micah was dealing with these issues, um, yeah, it, it, it made it difficult for people to hear his message. These problems are going to be intensified, I think, in the century that follows for a prophet like Jeremiah. Uh, after God delivered the city of Jerusalem in 701 B.C. in this miraculous way and God took care of the Assyrian army, that simply added to the presumption that the city of Jerusalem was always inviolable to enemy attack. And, and that was, you know, God's protection and God's deliverance of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, that was part of the worship and that was part of the theological traditions that were celebrated in the city of Jerusalem. In the Psalter, we have passages like Psalm 46 and Psalm 48 and Psalm 76 that celebrate the fact that when the enemies of, of the Lord and the enemies of Israel, when they attack the city of Jerusalem, God defends his city and God fights for them. God protects his hometown. Psalm 132 verses 13 and 14 the Lord has elected and the Lord has chosen Jerusalem as his dwelling place. And so when a prophet like Micah was saying Jerusalem is going to be reduced to rubble, he was challenging directly that ideology. 
And for Jeremiah dealing with that ideology after the city had already been delivered in 701 was an even more difficult task. And so that's why Jeremiah, as he preaches his famous temple sermon and says in chapter 7, uh, do not trust in deceptive words. Do not trust in this idea, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. The fact that the temple is there is going to protect us. You have made God's dwelling place a den of robbers because you've divorced covenant blessing from covenant responsibility. So when Jeremiah is going to preach this same message a hundred years later, they're going to say, this guy is a false prophet. He needs to die. But, but Micah and Jeremiah, what I want us to understand is they are both confronting a false understanding of God's promises to Israel. Even in the Psalms, as there is this focus on the fact that the Lord is going to protect Jerusalem, the Lord is going to defend Jerusalem, the Lord is going to intervene and save the city from its enemies, um, there was an underlying theology behind all of that that if the people wanted to enjoy God's blessing, they would have to be the kind of people that were worthy of that blessing. If God was going to defend and protect the city of Jerusalem as his dwelling place, it needed to be a city that reflected the glory and the purity and the holiness of the Lord. Part of the tradition in the Psalms is not just that God fights for Zion, but in Psalm 15 and Psalm 24, who has the right to dwell on God's holy hill? Those that have clean hands and a pure heart. And so they had highlighted the promises of Psalm 46 or Psalm 48 or Psalm 76. In Jeremiah's day, they had pointed to 701 and said, God's going to deliver us now the same way that he had delivered the same way that he delivered us then. The prophets have to confront that false ideology. If the people wanted the city of Jerusalem to be protected by God, they would also have to renounce uh, their confidence and their trust in their own arms and in their own weapons and in their military resources, and they would have to trust in God. That was part of the tradition of the Psalms as well. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. We put our trust in the Lord our God. So Micah, uh, in the time before uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah is going to do the same thing. They are going to confront a false understanding of the Zion tradition. God is not going to protect Jerusalem no matter what. Remember what he did to Shiloh. God will judge Jerusalem uh, if it is not the kind of city that God desires and designs it to be. And, and that's, the ideology, that's the conflict that is going on as Micah is preaching this message. That is one of the reasons why this message is so hard for the people to hear. Okay? So we, we, end, this, we end this first section with there's, uh, there's the judgment that is going to fall in chapter 1. The Assyrian army marches through. In chapter 2, there's an explanation. Here's why that judgment is going to occur. As we open the second section of the book... Um, Micah is again going to begin this section by establishing the sins that form the basis of God's judgment. And, 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 and it's again the practice of injustice and the false message of the prophets who have led the people astray. But notice how he does this in chapter 3. And one of, the, one of the things that I think as you read and you study the prophets that you grow to love and appreciate is that you begin to love and to appreciate the richness of the metaphors and the images that they use, both in, both, both in negative and positive ways. There is a powerful metaphor at the beginning of chapter 3 portraying what the wickedness and the injustice uh, of, the nation of uh, the nations of Israel and Judah was like. The prophet says this, And I said, Hear, you heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? Okay, we're right back at the issue of social justice again. You who hate the good and love the ra'ah, love evil. Now here's where the metaphor begins. You tear the skin off from my people and their flesh from off of their bones. You eat the flesh of my people, you flay their skin from off of them, 
and you break their bones into pieces. You chop them up like meat in a pot and like flesh in a cauldron. And, and to get the attention of these leaders and to help them to see the horrific nature of the crimes that he commit, they have committed, the prophet, liter, the prophet here figuratively compares them to cannibals. You are taking these poor people, you are flaying them and, and doing things that, uh, that would have been true of the Assyrian army and you're cutting them up, you're chopping them up and you're putting them in a pot and you're cooking them like stew. And again, I think this, this would have been a message that, uh, that would have been very difficult for these people to swallow. Uh, pardon the pun here. Wow, does, does God really see us like cannibals? Are, are we, are, we're, we're simply trying to, uh, to execute justice. And, 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 and they often, I think, would have used the Mosaic Law and things like the, the provisions about debt slavery. They would have used the law legally to break the law. And, and they don't see themselves in this way. God wants them to understand what he really thinks uh, of their sins and their crimes. In God's eyes, what you are doing you're no different than cannibals. And the punishment is going to fit the crime because these people that have abused and mistreated and taken advantage of others, these, these people who have engaged in this horrifically inhumane treatment of others, verse 4, when they cry out to the Lord, He will not answer them. He will hide His face from them at that time because they have made their deeds ra'ah. And in a sense, in, in all the ways that the book of Micah uh, is, is emphasizing the practice of Ra'ah in Israel and Judah, coming after the book of Jonah, in a sense what we get as we compare these two books in their alignment in the, in the book of the Twelve, Samaria and Jerusalem are no different than Nineveh. And the leaders of Judah need to realize the seriousness of their crimes. They're just like cannibals. When the prophet Isaiah, and again, in many ways, the messages of Isaiah and Micah, we see how they complement each other. Uh, Isaiah is going to compare the leaders of Israel and Judah, and the, as particularly the leaders in Jerusalem. He's going to talk to them as if they were the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, 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 and wow, the, the leaders of God's hometown are equated with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to say, when you lift your hands up to me in prayer, I, I, I'm not going to listen to those prayers. I'm not going to hear your cries. Micah says the same thing here. And Isaiah says, the reason is, as you lift up your hands to God, I see the bloodshed that's there in the way that you've oppressed and taken advantage of your neighbors. Isaiah compared them to murderers. Micah compares them to cannibals. And I'm sure, again, they would have protested and said, hey, we're not guilty of this kind of violence. But in, but in the system that God had established in ancient Israel and in the, in, in the way that God had given the law and told them that they were to be just and fair and open-handed in the way that they, had tre that they treated their neighbors, in the way that God had provided for every Israelite to have his own inheritance of land and every family to have their own inheritance of land, when these leaders were using unjust means to take those things away, even if it seemed legal in the way that they were doing this, in God's eyes, by depriving others of their ability uh, to, 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 to earn a living uh, or, or to provide for their family and their basic needs, they were no different than murderers and cannibals. And so the prophet Micah is going to remind us of the seriousness of the covenant responsibilities that God has placed upon Israel. And then that's why at the end of this message, in chapter 3, verse 12, Zion will be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. Without repentance without a change of heart and a change of direction and a change of behavior, this is what is going to happen uh, to the kingdom of Judah. But the, the, the thing that could always happen when a prophet preached this kind of message is that there was always the opportunity that if there was the right kind of response, God would relent and God would change his mind. 
Uh, we saw that in, in the city of Nineveh. They repent of the evil that they have done, and God relents and does not send the judgment. Now, when they return to that evil later on, and 150 years later, Nahum will talk about the judgment of God that is going to come on, Jerusalem, on, on Nineveh, and the city will ultimately be destroyed. The same thing here. Micah announces the absolute, unconditional destruction of Jerusalem. And if things had not changed, this is what would have taken place in the 8th century. But because, of Micah, but because of Micah's message and because of Hezekiah's repentant response to this, God delays the judgment, God relents from destroying Jerusalem, and God changes his mind. Now later on, as we move forward and we go to the time of the Babylonian crisis, we go to the prophet Jeremiah and Ezekiel, we go to the message of people like Zephaniah and Habakkuk, Jerusalem has returned to their sinful ways. As a result of that, the message of judgment that Micah originally proclaimed goes back into effect. And just like with Nahum and Nineveh, God ultimately carries out the judgment that is delayed here. But what we are reminded in all of this is the wonderful give and take that takes place where God legitimately gives his people the opportunity to repent and to change their ways so that this judgment can be averted. And God bases the final decisions and whether he will bring judgment or salvation on the, on the responses that people have to him. Our responses really matter. They are a matter of life and death. And, and so throughout the Old Testament prophets and throughout the Old Testament itself, when, when God announces judgment and people intercede and pray, God relents and God changes his mind. When prophets announce that God is going to bring judgment and a, and a king like Hezekiah takes that seriously or the king of Nineveh takes that seriously and he proclaims a fast and his people repent, God honors those decisions. Response to the word of God is a matter of life and death and, and real change can happen uh, when, when, uh, when people respond to God in the right way. Again, we have in Micah's ministry another example of the principle of Jeremiah 18, 7 to 10. If God announces judgment and the people repent, God will relent, God will change his mind. And, and also the reverse of that is true as well. God has, has, has stepped out of eternity in a sense here. He has, in, he, he has engaged in these give and take relationships with people. And as they respond to him and as they honor his word and as they uh, have a repentant and re obedient response to that, God is willing to take away the judgment that he has decreed against them. Now, in recent years, the idea of God changing his mind has become a major theological controversy. All right, And I do not think that this, uh, this imagery in the Old Testament of God changing his mind uh, has in any way um, uh, the, the, the idea or the inference that God has limited knowledge of the future. In, in some sense, uh, like all language of God, this is metaphorical. God knows the beginning from the end. But what we have going on here again is that God has stepped into time and into these real relationships and God does engage in these relationships so that the people uh, and their responses ultimately do matter. The prayers of a prophet like an Amos or the prayers of a prophet like a Moses when he intervenes for the people and judgment has been announced, they matter. The repentance of a Hezekiah when Micah warns him of judgment is coming, it matters. And so God does not capriciously change his mind because... Uh, of a whim. Uh, you know, I, I capriciously change my mind all the time. I'm going to eat a salad today, and I'm going to eat, and then I pass by Papa John's, and I capriciously change my mind. The, the Old Testament is not talking about that when it talks about God changing his mind. Uh, but it is talking about something that is a very real attribute or characteristic of God. This is a metaphor about God, but it's not just a metaphor. God truly, ultimately, changes his final decisions and the final outcomes of events based on the way that people respond to him. There's also the dilemma of certain passages like 
uh, in, in the book of Numbers, in Numbers chapter 23 or in 1 Samuel 15, there are Old Testament passages that tell us God does not change his mind. And then we, we bump up against passages like this that we've just looked at. Uh, Jeremiah 26, Jonah chapter 3, Jeremiah chapter 18, Exodus chapter 32, Amos chapter 7. God does change his mind. How do we deal with that? Well, part of the way that we deal with that is not simply saying, well, the places where God doesn't change his mind, that's what he's really like, and these other places are just metaphors. They are both attributes of the God of the Old Testament. But what we realize is that there are certain situations and there are certain circumstances where God responds and says, I will not change my mind. When God has made a covenant promise to the people of Israel, even though a prophet like Balaam in Numbers 22 to 24 tries to stand up and put a curse on them, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. God will not turn away from those anchoring covenant promises that he has made and that he has sworn to carry out. And, and, and my friend Mike Grisani, as he deals with this issue, will talk about the covenant promises that God has made to Israel as being anchors. These are things that they know God will not relent from and God will not change his mind about. There are also circumstances, like in the case of where God has rejected King Saul in 1 Samuel 15, when the Lord has said, I am going to do this, I will not alter my course of action. I am not going to, to change. Even though Samuel prays all night and realizes that there are circumstances where God is open and responsive to prayers, when God has sworn an oath or when a person has crossed a line and God has said, I'm not going to change, God in those cases does not change his mind. But in these other cases, and in the majority of times when the prophets are preaching, and again, even when they make absolute statements of judgment, there is always the possibility that if there is a right response to God's message, that God will relent and not send the judgment that he has threatened. The prophet Micah had a serious message to preach to the people of Judah. He is reminding them that our relationship with God involves both blessing and responsibility. And because of Hezekiah's positive response to that, um, Judah was ultimately spared from the judgment of destruction at the hands of Assyria. Micah reminds us that, that our relationship with God also includes blessing and responsibility. And that we have a responsibility as God has made these wonderful promises to us to respond with the kind of obedience uh, and, and repentance uh, and a willingness to live the life uh, that God has called us to live in response to what God has done for us. Micah, as a prophet, reminds us of the proper understanding of what a relationship with God is really all about. This is Dr. Gary Yates in his lecture series on the Book of the Twelve. This is lecture number 20, Micah, the Message, chapters 1 through 3.